Hi everyone, thanks for taking your time out on a Sunday to have a chat again. And today we have with us Josh. Joshua, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Um, I'm a former historian who has a PhD in Renaissance history and then founded a couple of companies, uh, worked in an interdisciplinary think tank with scientists and economists and anthropologists and uh, wrote some economic software to keep track of some of these medieval documents. Finished my PhD and then went on and founded a couple of companies in artificial intelligence. We wrote some algorithms, sold those to an MIT spin out and then sold another one to a public company. And then in 17, we created a, a crypto investment fund, just investing in protocols in early stage companies and also running the tech ourselves, doing some validation. Part of the draw behind that was how close what I saw unfolding crypto reflected what I had seen in, in Renaissance and Reformation history when these communities use these decentralized technologies to coordinate socially and improve their own situation. And so I, I started writing about that just a little bit. And then I met Lisa when I think you're asking for books on crypto that could inform, you know, a way to think about it, esoteric, you know, philosophy and history. And, uh, and we picked up a conversation from there. You know, the conversation with Josh was very interesting, and that's why we wanted to bring the conversation over here. And I think the good way to get started, you talk about how in the Renaissance period, it's all about social coordination. And if you look at how communities and societies coordinated from the past, it started with small little villages and communities, and it was an informal, very moral kind of social contract between, I know your family, I know your mom, I know your grandma, and so it was a very informal contract in a village. Where we say, okay, we'll do this and you behave properly because this is going to be how we deal with each other in our small little village. But as the village started to grow bigger, it's kind of hard to make these kind of social contracts because you don't have grandmothers sitting by the windows and observing everyone's actions and then gossiping in the market time. And we had to travel to another village to speak with them and to trade with them. So in that case, it became a bit more difficult to try and coordinate all these different social interactions. Because a market or a village or an economy, an ecosystem, is all about transaction and exchange. So previously, we started with these kind of social contracts. And then we moved on to colonization. And that becomes a bit more difficult to coordinate. And then we had machineries to kind of coordinate those kind of stuff, like people coming in with their weapons and everything. And then we had religion. And today, we have money as a religion to coordinate that. So what are your thoughts around that? What has history taught us? I think that's a good way to start the description of that. And so one way I like to think about history is, and this might not be the right model, you, you never want to confuse the model with the thing itself, right? Um, it's like when you're studying science and you make an atom and like you make it out of little pieces of wood and macaroni. That's not the atom, that's just a way to look at it. So one way I look at history is this pendulum swinging back and forth between aggregation and decentralization. And yeah, you're absolutely right. What you had is throughout the Middle Ages, you had power and wealth and economic value becoming increasingly concentrated century after century, you know, bit after bit. And part of this was aggregated in the Roman Catholic Church, but it wasn't just religious. They, they actually acted as a political entity. And so I think the way we can best view ourselves is almost as, you know, medieval European, you know, farmers, basically. Our world is fundamentally aggregated and pulled together, and we exist in this world of hierarchy. And what happened was during the Middle Ages, communities tried to coordinate socially and resist this hierarchy and create more free economic markets and exchange information more freely with one another. But they could never really pull it off. Each time, you know, you're at the bottom of this pyramid, this, you know, not just religious pyramid, but this political pyramid. Each time they tried to do anything, they were smashed by those in power at the top of the pyramid. They couldn't coordinate effectively. They couldn't communicate ideas effectively with one another, nor could they incentivize one another economically. And they couldn't share value uh, very efficiently. And so what happened at least last time, throughout the 14th and 15th and then into the 16th century, they call this the Renaissance. And Renaissance is just a fancy word for rebirth. It was a rebirth of not just their economic system or their political system, but actually their culture and their identity, how they thought about themselves as a rebirth of their world. And the other attempts at Renaissance and Reformation were smashed each time because they didn't have the decentralized technology to be able to effectively coordinate and build markets and take action. And so there were two particular new types of technology that allowed this renaissance to actually work last time. And so that would be the printing press 
and double entry bookkeeping, which was a ledger. And so a ledger, you know, to your audience is, you know, obvious, but it was it was absolutely radical at that point in time. Credit and debit and left and right, it was it was something new. You know, Medici had rediscovered it, you know, from back in the, the Roman era. Uh, some of the people talked about it and it was used in North African communities. And so it was like magic. All of a sudden, the power brokers didn't have absolute control over the monetary system. You could do things like credit and you could essentially prevent false forks, increase velocity and composability and all these things. And so you have this explosion of financial technology around this idea of using ledger-based accounting and reconciliation system for these contracts. And so that was radical. It gave an increasing amount of people access to capital and it created a proto-capitalistic or proto-economic whole class, honestly, um, which was which was radical. And at the same time, there was a permissionless communication technology, and and that was the printing press, which was really interesting in its own right. And I'll take just a minute and talk about that because they intertwine, and then I can get to how this mirrors today, and we can go from whatever direction you want to go into. So the printing press was interesting in that it had been around for a while. And when we think printing press, we think, you know, machines or newspapers or somebody cranking on, you know, a Gutenberg Bible or something. But most of what was printed was actually images with big words and taglines. They were almost like the, they were actually the memes of the, the day. They're called Flugschriften. And so it was very much image as well as text. And what was fundamentally radical about it is it allowed you to share ideas at scale, where previously, if you wanted to share a document, an economic contract or a piece of literature, you know, it cost you a year's salary or 10 years salary to have a scribe copy the thing. You couldn't get access to the code, to the contract. It was locked away under you know, permission and observability. You being at the bottom of the pyramid probably wouldn't even have rights to access that contract. And the printing press allowed the dissemination of ideas at scale and also the openness of these contracts um, to a lesser degree, which we can talk about with you know, NFTs being kind of on-chain rights and contracts. And so the other piece was the printing press, the technology, it was fundamentally distributed, you know, decentralized. The power structures didn't like it, obviously, because they had controlled the means of not just economic coordination, but information. Um, they tried to outlaw it, but it didn't really work very well because it, it was decentralized in the sense it only took, you know, it took you a couple hours in a shop off grid. They tried to KYC it and register printers and what have you, and that didn't work. And they were placed in this this no-win situation where the, the technology was growing so fast and the audience was growing so rapidly that they either had to engage in this battle back and forth or they could ignore it. And so they ended up engaging it, which led to all sorts of things we can get into. And so that printing press actually, it created its own market. No one was literate at the time. It's like 5% of people were literate. You couldn't have access to a handwritten document. Um, and it went from being a year's salary or 10 years salary to being the cost of you know, a chicken, essentially. And so families could access these new radical ideas. And these radical ideas created a market and which created literacy um, as, as folks followed on to, they had the connective tissue around that. And so at that point in time, you have a fundamentally hierarchical world and these two technologies sharing value at scale and sharing information around what's important, what's worth value um, in some sense, and then sharing who you are and what you think. And so those were new technologies that communities hadn't had previously that allowed a, a fundamental reworking of their economic system, their financial system, their communication system their political systems that fundamentally redo the lines, um, as well as their cosmology, not just religious, but how they viewed their universe and their world and their, their place therein and how they needed to relate to one another. And so you have this explosion of not just arts and culture, but economic uh, viability and new classes of people doing new things. And so I guess I should stop there, but that was the, the point at which we use decentralized technology in these communities to essentially recreate our world, both economically and socioculturally. Yes, absolutely. So based on your experience, understanding how countries started up again and rebirth, renaissance, there are a lot of things such as new tools and new tools like technology. We have things like new resources, like ideas, information and value creation, because having a market, it's all about value creation and then value transfer. This is how we can create very productive ecosystems that benefits everyone. And then with new technology and new tools and new resources, we can start rebuilding new systems. This is something that history has told us since, you know, before the Dark Ages, after the Dark Ages, during different parts of history, we have seen that emerging. Today is not that much different. Today we have new tools, which is decentralized ledger technology. 
we have new resources and resources as in we're still sharing ideas we're still sharing information which is an intangible asset you can't exactly quantify them in terms of how do you price a cup but these are their new ideas in different forms in which we can integrate them to rebuild the systems that we know as super inefficient and we're seeing this taking place right now at this crossroad yeah so to summarize that whole story that was just the context like history would teach us one that communities are very powerful when they can work together and coordinate, you know, communication with one another without a centralized mediator and coordinate value and build markets. And when they do that, they build markets in new and unexpected ways. In the old world as, you know, farmers, they couldn't have imagined being, you know, a shopkeeper. It never would have even entered their mind, right? Partially, not just because that didn't exist, but how would they have gotten the, the funds to be able to do that? How would those contracts have worked? And the economic technology allowed them to do that. And so we can almost think of ourselves, you know, today as, you know, evil in the sense that we're unlocking this like new world of economic and financial market creation that we only have like a really limited and dim sense of what's going to happen we're like we're like medieval farmers looking down the street and someone's opening up a shop right and there's you're like wait what's a shop can you explain that is it like a market no no we actually buy this inventory and we roll this in well wait how are you doing that do you have these are you bringing these goats and these cows no no i have a piece of paper and on the piece of paper there's like a number and it's it's a credit that allows me to do something it's so abstract and it's so weird to them and for the folks on you know watching this you know not weird to us but to your friends and family or the broader media the idea of crypto just being this weird abstract thing that was exactly the same reaction like previously you traded cows for coins right that was tangible and you could touch it and everyone understood that and so that was one piece of what happened it was new and you go through this dip of adoption the other thing is to your point lisa you almost have to create a destroy or destructively create the old world, right? And so part of what happened the last time around was when communities got together, they destroyed that, that hierarchy. And so that was images of people, you know, doing very crude and grotesque things to, you know, their power hierarchy, right? Like, so they're pooping in the Pope's hat and they're like demons birthing, you know, different curious, like crazy, crazy, profane stuff. But the idea was that everybody was had an overturned window, they had this particular way of viewing reality, and they almost had to prick that window to break it apart, right? And so by by sharing these these printed, you know, memes of, of you know, pooping in your authority's hat, and at that point, the hierarchy, the pinnacle of their world was, you know, the Pope in that, at that point in time. For us, it's the U.S. dollar, like our fiat currency, petrodollar is like our medieval Roman Catholic papacy. And so when we say money printer go burr in the States, we're, we're essentially like pricking the same thing. We're saying, this thing you have actually isn't real. It's not based on you know any sort of economic underlying reality. It's it's all fiat in the sense it's a religious word. It's like we say fiat. Let this be. This is worth something. It's like it's very specific religious core uh, overtones to it. And so one of the things history teaches us is communities are really good at coordinating, and they almost have to destroy what was before they build what will become. And economically, you can't imagine what it's what it's going to become. Um, Part of that is because it's the nature of this like bazaar over the cathedral, people exchanging in a marketplace instead of top down saying, do this or do that. And so, you know, essentially my thesis is that's the point we're at right now, right? Um, you know, their ledger based technology is our crypto, right? I mean, it's literally ledger. I mean, it's like, it's like very, very tightly aligned. Oh, it increases composability and a lot, all the same benefits we have. You open up access. The printing press is our internet. That sounds a little weird. You might be saying, hey, what does the internet have to do with crypto? Like, I fundamentally think the internet hasn't really happened yet. We're only seeing it begin right now with crypto, with, uh, you know, decentralized hashing or permaweb or Arweave or Graph. Like, we're in this weird position where we saw the internet here, but the people who started it in the 70s really want it to be decentralized without a kill switch so, so communities could coordinate. And then we had kind of a false start or a false positive where we were able to share a little bit. But yeah, everything's on AWS or, I mean, it's in these fang walled gardens. And so historians will look back and say they're kind of dabbling around with it but it was only the internet only found its like legs or its footing when crypto came on so now we have a way to communicate information in a decentralized way to coordinate and a way to communicate value and so just like at the last renaissance where everything was toppled you know people pooping in a you know pope's hat people saying money printer go burr and poking the the u.s fiat dollar um there was this massive recreation of roles and what was meaningful and just economic creation, honestly, in terms of you didn't have to be a farmer, you could interact and exercise autonomy like through a market. And so that's what I think we're, ha we're seeing right now. We're just, we're just at the cusp of it. So we don't quite 
know what's going on. Um, we're like the medieval farmers looking at the people opening a shop down and saying, I wonder what that means. They're selling things and they're, they're recording it in a book. That's really weird. Great points. You mentioned that society is very good at coordination. The thing is, society is good at small micro scale coordination where people are physically you know, near each other, like small little villages. But when we start transacting across the internet, across jurisdiction, across geographical location, it becomes very hard to coordinate. And this is where the power of, of tokens can really come in. Because yeah. if we go back to what is a market, what, what are countries, what are ecosystems, it's basically just this common ground where a buyer and seller comes together and then they trade and transact. That's it. And this is coordination. So when people coming together to trade, it's, it's not that difficult. It's not science. It's just, I want something, you have something, let's come in to trade. The science part is that how do we get everyone to come to this place to trade? How do we use this technology? How do we use this platform? And this is one of the biggest benefits that token can bring, which is this incentivization tool. Because I'm an economist, right? So people only do things because they're incentivized to do so. Adam Smith said that the butcher in the shop didn't cut meat so that I'm worried that you don't have anything to eat, so I'm going to chop up a cow uh, or chop up whatever animal so that you can go and eat them. The butcher doesn't do that. The butcher is incentivized to do that because he's paid to do so. So how can we translate this idea that we know people behave because of incentives and the fact that we need more coordination to create these markets for people to trade? This is where oh. network is formed. This is where value is formed. And we can use tokens to promote that coordination. And this is so important because, yes, we don't always need tokens. But why do we need tokens? Because tokens help in the coordination of market creation and value creation. Yeah, that's, that's such an excellent point. So, you know, in the, in the previous world, you could only trade. You didn't trade, you know, on a small transaction. You had to trade through centralized aggregation, right? You went to a market. There are four markets a year. They were only in select locations. If you wanted to sell your goods, you had to go to that place at that time, and there were only these limited windows, right? And why was that? That was essentially because the markets were dictated from on high. They were allowed. They were permissioned. The you know, the people who controlled the coin said, we're going to set up shop here and we're going to not only take a piece of it in the market, we're going to tell you when you can transact with anyone else. And so it limited the amount of money that flowed through a market as well as my connection with someone else or your connection with someone else because it, it had to go through these points of connection. And so what happened with the advent of the ledger based accounting was it, it broke those markets apart. So decentralization. So our token is essentially, you know, a an updated form of that sort of double entry bookkeeping that allowed us to interact. So that allows us to transact as a market, not in a centralized way, but in a decentralized way, which what does that mean to really dig into it? Well, it means we can do it more than four times a year. We can do it, you know, more than just at these appointed places. We can do it, you know, side to side. And so it allows the markets to become local and to become super small and to almost go back to that village that you're talking about where the grandma's looking over there. And we can have a transaction with not only without a mediator, but we can have a transaction at our time, at our pace, on our own terms around a contract, right? And so that introduces like greater degrees of freedom into a market, as well as much greater access both throughout time and space geographically. And that has massive benefits to markets. And so that's, a, that's one of the things that it unlocked. When I big picture it unlocked this new class of, of capitalists, right? Well, how did it do that? Well, it unlocked it because there's more money, but also that decentralized nature of how money created markets was super important um, because communities are always able to create markets in a much more effective way, um, you know, bottom up, decentralized, rather than someone telling you through here, here, because they're always acting in their own interests, right? Where, you know, you and I can have, you know, mutual interests, and now we can incentivize one another instead of have to be incentivized from someone else. So your point is a thousand percent correct. Like, tokens are the, the unlock. That Renaissance shaped the following 500 years, right? It shaped who we are today. We still, it was the birth of the, the modern period, right? And that was because people could interact economically with one another without this mediated control. And so that's like literally the same period we're at right now. Our technology, instead of just you know, notebooks to keep our ledgers, is a token to keep our ledger, which allows us to coordinate at a more decentralized level, which in turn benefits us rather than mediated individuals. And if history teaches us anything, will explode the value of, of markets globally. Absolutely. I think at the end, we are creating micro markets, micro economies, and powered by the right incentives. And this explosion will, will take off. Like, absolutely, no doubt. On that note, I am worried about two things. The first thing is that we're exploding so fast. We are growing 
tremendously fast that the people lagging behind will take centuries to keep up because this is where compound interest really pays off, right? If you're in front, you keep up with the times, you'll be okay. But probably 80% of people are not keeping up with time. And that's going to be very difficult to bring them on board. We can build the best tools. Everything we talk about, tools, technology, these are, these are toolkits that we can use. If you don't know how to use them, what's the point of creating them? Like, that is very scary. And the second thing is governance. One of the biggest conversations that I think we'll start speaking about in maybe the next five to eight years is the changing narrative of governance. What we're doing over here is to distribute power to people. Everyone gets to hold power. The thing about power is that we all like power, but the, the truth about power is responsibility. We have to be responsible for all the different decisions we make. We have to, to own the consequences, good or bad. And we, we have to deal with those consequences. How do we deal with them? We can't say that it's technology's fault because everyone owns technology. It's just a protocol. So how do we deal with governance and how do we deal with the people who are lagging behind? Oh, man, that's so good. There is a TV show. It was called Little Britain. It was popular. You've probably seen the meme where it's the woman who has the big glasses on and she says she's typing away and she says computer says no. It's a kind of a ridiculous meme because she's just working at a bank and they ask, hey, can I get a loan? And she has no agency or no ability to interact with a person. So she says computer says no. Computer says no. Computer says no. Anyway, no, I just love the idea of like, we're, we, you know, we can't say, oh, computer says no. Right. We have to like exercise like some agency and like interact and like. If you believe that historical thesis that communities are using this technology, right, like just like suspend disbelief and say, hmm, that kind of makes sense. We had this like, you know, explosion economically. We had a rise of the middle class. We had small shopkeepers. We had burgeoning literacy. We had artists, you know, more than just one or two percent of the population. We had all this like great stuff came out of this unlock with this technology. So what does that mean? Like what happens for society and what's our obligation like in that, right? If like we're the ones coordinating, if it's not top down, if it's not the technology telling us what to do, and if we're kind of like exercising control as like sovereign individuals, like, so what does it mean? Like, so yeah, there's a couple, like those are like the two great questions, I think, like, so let's take them in turn. Like, I think number one, this like, this adoption and this like splitting, I think that's super important. And by the way, this is why I'm excited for the conversation because no one, no one is having this conversation around crypto, right? It, partially it's because like we're early, but partially because we don't really like talking about social impact or consequences of what we do, intended or unintended. And also we kind of shy away. We love opportunity, but we don't like the flip side of the coin, which is obligation, right? That's like not in our, our bag so much. So I'm like, I'm like super, super like appreciative that you're, we're having this conversation. It's number one when I say that. So yeah, that splitting, that's like really important, right? Like the difference between like laboring on a farm as a serf or somebody else and like not having an opportunity when a shop's opening up down the street and you just, you're not aware of it. You, you never figure out, you know, literacy, you never join the community. You never really get the idea of what the piece of paper is to be able to kind of take control of what have you. Yeah, that's like, that's super important. So what happened historically was you had ha a few haves, everybody else was have nots. And so when they use the technology, you had this rise in the middle class. We're in a different situation. We have this aggregation but we have kind of this lump here, right? And so we're going to have the opposite. Instead of everybody moving towards the middle, we're going to have this pulling apart, right? And like, we're starting to see that, you know, part of that is around just pure technology, you know, AI taking people's jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Like crypto is different than just replacement of economic, you know, uh, inputs. It's a, uh, it literally allows us the opportunity to become these new artisans and capitalists. So there's like an adoption curve. So the first piece is like education, like definitely like, so how do we handle that? Like, absolutely education and like you have you know foundations doing little bits and pieces but the thing we need so we're super early this isn't criticism of anyone or anything it's just we're early like what do we need to do everybody working together so we need to be doing more education just flat out like not just like foundation i want to educate you about my protocol and how it works but like these are core economic concepts this is how you improve your life and your situation like literally what you're doing so that's why i'm like a huge proponent of that we need more of you and more people like you and not just pure play economic and token design you know that play to earn you know participate to earn all of that stuff so that's like number one number two like 
part of crypto's success will be like in its adoption. And by that, I mean, like, does crypto just become like new rails for banks or, you know, better blockchain technology for IBM and Amazon? Or does it live up to the promise of this kind of social coordination of community? And so I personally think that's going to be a foot race to adoption. And like by adoption, I don't mean necessarily just pure economic token design on DeFi. I actually mean crypto intruding into the real world um, and acting as an economic battery to power real world businesses, which is kind of crazy. And so like we're starting to see that now with NFTs and art and that's fine. But if you look really carefully, you're finding places where crypto is moving into the real world to drive adoption, like play to earn for sure on the video games and what have you. But also these weird little things like Helium is one example. And also full disclosure, I've either like know everyone in the space and like them or hate them or they talk to me or they don't talk to me. So I'm, I'm totally biased for my disclosures, right? All over the place. But like love Helium, love the guys at Helium. And like that's an example of like, you know, a little box and it broadcasts Internet of Things, IoT. It's also starting to do 5G. And it literally, if you're a small business owner or a restaurant owner or a bodega, you can run this box. And if you're early in your space, you know, you're earning, you know, five, six, you know, even seven figures. Right? You're, you're paying your rent with it, right? And you're getting through like an economic downturn. And you don't have the skills necessary to code. You need to learn that and you need to learn DeFi. But literally by running this box and running an iOS app, you've already paid value into your space and your rent and now you're broadcasting it and so you're unlocking that or here in the united states you know the small business owners if they're public they have to play music licensing rights right they have to pay fifteen thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars to like you know bmi or any of these people they can you know run audius you know for example and remove that whole cost center and actually earn these tokens and like these tokens like as they start trading these are worth more you know it moves them from the most valuable things for neighborhood and for physical community construction have been the least economically compensated in a lot of ways because of the stacked mediation. And so crypto allows you know, these small business owners to literally remove these mediated cost centers and to actually own as well, right? Like I know Uber drivers that like are earning more listening to audios and trading the tokens, right? So that's part of it. So like broad-based adoption as crypto moves into real space. And one other piece around that is I think NFTs are like also one thing to think about, and this kind of gets into token design as well, which we can go through later, in terms of like on-chain rights for contracts, right? And so like for real estate and what have you. So right now DeFi is awesome, but it's like, okay, if global, you know, stocks are 200 trillion and global, you know, bonds are 200 trillion and crypto is 2 trillion and, you know, real estate's 100 trillion, it's like a little tiny piece of it, right? But like if I can actually have on-chain rights, for those assets, insurance or options or things in the real world, now I start sucking the real world into like into crypto, right? And so like that also allows me to interact and grow that. And so the future adoption of crypto probably isn't just people coding Python or you know uh, Solidity or Viper, and it'll definitely be part of that. And then there's another circle where figuring out DeFi and token design economics that you're doing awesome. But there's this broader circle of just people who don't care about any of it, but they want to use it as an economic battery to like support their business in real life. And then a broader circle, circle still about education. Like I actually think we're going to learn. We need to be promoting this. We're going to learn you know our economics through crypto, not through like you know, taking a university degree, right? We're going to learn our simulations and scenarios through like crypto. Um, so that's part of that splitting, I think, is like how quickly does crypto get into the real world to prevent that and like broadly think about us differently. And just one last thing, I think the interesting thing about crypto is like, it's just so fundamentally, it's antithetical inside out from like AI, right? So like we wrote like some AI software and did a company and sold it. And like from time to time, I'll, I'll lecture at fancy places. I know the AI side well, like, that's why I love about crypto. It's just inside out and outside down. It, it gives asymmetric advantage to the little person on the long tail, right? Instead of this consolidation. And so, you know, AI from, you know, from that perspective, crypto literally allows these opportunities by removing these like mediated places so we can create markets and express value for things that don't work within an aggregated system. So all of a sudden, esoteric knowledge becomes like valuable, right? I might be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles collector and I can use Upshot on NFTs. Number one, I think out of it, Crypto provides this opportunity for everyone. The question is, is it going to be reemergence of neobanks like or is it going to be everyone having access? If it succeeds in everyone having access, it's A, through education, like what you're doing, and B, through this real world intrusion and adoption, which is like 
just starting to happen and we're not really talking about right now. Just like at the with the printing press, right? It, it wasn't that everybody was literate and adopted it. The technology created the interaction in the economic market as a result of it, which is like really wild historically. So that's like, we can stop on that, but your point on the, uh, the nation state and the coordination and the obligation, I definitely want to hit on because that's so important. But let's just stop on this first piece of like, you know, crypto's opportunity from social impact and construction, because I think that's super important and like people aren't really having that conversation. So thank you for raising the issue. I'll just make one point before Will has a question. I like your last point where anyone can take anything that they're expert at and it could be Pokemon or or Axie or whatever kind of interest that they're absolutely in. This is value. This is this is absolute value that people create and can share and other people can enjoy. As soon as you produce value, someone consumes that value, that is value creation. Value creation is, has shifted from the religion of money is everything to as soon as you provide value, someone accepts the value, you are valuable. And you know how I see this? I see this as the new world's UBI. UBI yeah. is oh. not just about money, but UBI is about the, the resource, the energy required to run a node so that you can use that node to create different kind of tools that can be given to other people and they yeah. can consume that. This is real value creation, not just from UBI, because why do I want to put trust in a government just printing money and inflating it when I myself can create that value and it can be shared? Like, I think that is something that blockchain can absolutely do. And I'm super excited about it. No, that's great. Lynn, let me just like, let me just respond to that before we go to the second one, because that's like, that's really important. J digging down into the details. So like using the example of the small, like the small business owner, right? He's paying or she's paying rent for this space. She has resources, but they're locked. And like, it literally allows him or her to, to unlock the capital she's already locked up, right? And so she's running this little helium node. You know, it's not the, the landowner having Verizon with a contract. You can run it with a little antenna in your window, right? So you're like, you've paid money in, and now rather than just giving you, you know, cash in your, your wallet, you're able to like more effectively unlock the value that you've already paid in and make it generative, right? So instead of a cost center, it becomes like, you know, a revenue driver. So that's not so important for like, you know, a big bank, but for everybody else along the long tail, that's like awesome, right? Like being able to do that. And that's with your physical space, but being able to do it with your skill set, right? Like that's the other thing about blockchain is like, at the last renaissance, the reason why the nation state like rose back up is because the contract, there wasn't any visibility. There wasn't blockchain in that sense, right? We couldn't see into it. We didn't have, you know, perspicuity in, in a technical sense to be able to see that. And so like being able to see that allows us not only to unlock the assets we have, but to be able to lock our expertise, right? So just to really bleed this, this Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, I need another example that's not as hard to say. Let's just say Pokemon or whatever, right? So the basic idea is like just looking at this from like the NFT side, like you know, there's new top layers and protocols coming on, like Upshot's a great example, but like, and it's early, but if you look at like what it's going to become, I can say, do I like this or do I not like this, right? Or do I like this or do I not like this? And so like the real world assets as they're brought on chain, part of the problem is price discovery, right? And like, how do I do price discovery? Well, I can use an Oracle, I can fractionalize it, but also like outside of that, I have to have a bid or a purchase to really figure it out. So what if I have like humans that can't be replicated with AI in this sense, because there's something like, let's just say it's my secret sauce, right? Like I'm really good at Ninja Turtles. I know the idea behind it. I know what I like. I know what's valuable. And as I start interacting with this, my address is on chain. I get to see, oh, he was right about saying this was valuable versus this wasn't valuable. Like AI is additive, not like replacing the human, right? Like refining like the human skill set is really important. So I said this was valuable. The chain shows me, oh, it actually was valuable. It ended up selling like years in the future. That's credited through like taxonomy and metadata back to me. And so that allows me to say, hey, you know what? Josh is the guy that like really knows the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? And so he's like, he's ranked high at that, right? Or this type of real estate or that type of insurance on a token contract. And so like, now I'm not just doing it automatically. Lisa's is the person who knows this. And so like, I'm able to unlock my skills. Everyone else is able to see credit for the skills. I'm able to command a premium for my skills. And my skills can be super esoteric. It doesn't just have to be high speed quant trading. It can be types of Pokemon or like running pieces on a restaurant or real estate or what have you. And so like blockchain, like technically allowing us to like see who's good at what and then actually generatively allow me feedback where i haven't had it before to refine my skills with like reasonable feedback loop as well as like those are both super important like 
points that it allows me to find people. That's back to that coordination, right? I just don't go to a fair four times a year. Like now I can find you, right? We can have this conversation. I can find you and unlock my value that way. So that's like super, super duper important. So unlocking real world assets and unlocking your talents and like how the technology allows you to do that through blockchain or through these tokens. And then how do you capture value? Like onto tokens and uh, that kind of gets us into token design and governance and like seats of power and what have you. Um, Before we move sure. on to governance, Will has a very, yeah. very good question on distributing this, the social fabric that we're talking about. Will, do you want to ask your question? I did want to ask, one of the things that you've touched on is the kind of promise of blockchain to try and dis disintermediate from the middleman who were on the blockchain and all of that. I think the most pronounced place where I've seen this happen is with NFTs, where you have OpenSea, which is kind of like the giant aggregator of all of the NFTs. But mm. it got to the point where you can't really find things on OpenSea just by perusing around OpenSea so much. So then all of a sudden, all of these other curators pop up. And probably yeah. soon enough, we're going to have NFT agents. Is it inevitable for us to recreate the middle layer as there's a proliferation yeah, of these apps? Oh, man. That's a good question. Like, I think in some sense, yes, but I don't think it's dystopian in the sense of like a super aggregated middle layer. Like in some sense, yes, for sure. It doesn't need to be super concentrated like, you know, Amazon or Fang or, you know, walled garden type aggregated middle layer. There might be a long tail of, you know, curators specializing in this niche or that niche or this niche or that niche. And also the roles will start to overlap and blend where it's not just curation, they might be generating. So it also might be generative. And so I almost view that as like small business or bodegas or shops along the street. That's a different type of middle layer. That's like a long tail middle layer versus super aggregated middle layer. So I think some of that tends to happen throughout history, just no doubt. The other way to look at it, bigger picture, and I like using NFTs because it's a good microcosm. So you can almost think of it in waves, right? Like when I say we're early, I mean we're early. So everybody always uses the, the newspaper analogy for like what it means to be early. So early with the internet, you know, newspapers just put up, you know, their edition on PDF online, right? And, you know, they change it once a day. And that was like generation one. And then generation two was like, hey, maybe we can unlock the features and functions and native to the technology to try to align, you know, value around it. And so then you have searching and what have you. And everybody says, ha ha, we're just at the this pre precipice of like unlocking right now, just like the newspapers. And so like, that's true for sure. And you can think about NFTs like that. Like the reason why you have, you know, open scene, it's like eBay and chaos all over the place is because we're like, we're so early in it we haven't yet done this unlock, you know, nature, endemic to the nature of the technology. So the first phase of that will be like doing it by hand with curators. And I don't necessarily view that middle layer as being bad, especially if it's long tail, it provides op economic opportunity, as long as it's not super concentrated. But I do think there'll be another wave, which is an unlock, you know, endemic to the nature of the technology, just like we had with searchability, right? And then you'll have something like super and like third gen, basically, where it's, it's a different form of media. First gen is the media, just the tech puts up the media as is. Second gen is you have this interplay between features and functions within that same like form of media. Then third generation is the tech itself actually creates the form of media. And so think of it as social media or what have you. And so like, in that sense, like where NFT is like, we're just teaching retail one thing at this point in time, right? We're just saying, hey, imagine eBay, but like for digital goods. And everybody's like, okay, because retail tends to get like one thing at a time over a two year or five year cycle. And so that's why we have that. So I think what you're saying is absolutely accurate, but it's within this time window. Like the next thing you'll have is the chaos reduced through boutique curated shops. Great, new ways for people to make livings. But then you'll have like the tech unlocking the boutique curation of that. And you're starting to see some of that already. And then third wave, you'll see stuff that like you can't imagine right now, just like the medieval farmer couldn't imagine the, the shop, you know, the, down the street. And that will be something different. Um, and that's you're seeing glimpses of that with like loot and nouns where it's totally abstract. You just say, I have these properties and I can build my own own, you know, world and I'm using time as a function. So it's a new way of building a company or a corporation. Like, and that's the intelligentsia of the internet. Love that. That's like catnip for us. Like I'm wrapped with like, like, I think it's super fascinating because you can see the future coming. What's that third unlock that prevents the super aggregation that you're talking about. But the problem is like, it's awesome. Probably be the future. Something not loot per se, but something like that with just abstract out properties. 
the problem is like you have to be super cerebral to adopt that abstraction right now, right? It's like you have to be a D and D, a Dungeons and Dragons like dungeon master to figure out what abstract is and tell your own story without the visuals. And so that's not like mainstream adoption. The same thing with nouns. And so when the next wave comes, it'll look like something that we have, we've already seen. And so it's back to like that Craigslist. So everybody makes that joke and says, ha ha. You know, the newspaper is just doing PDFs. But you have to understand that in terms of market adoption, that serves a really specific function, right? That's not a bug, it's a feature. There's a reason why every designer said, let's redo Craigslist, and Craigslist wasn't redone. It served retail by saying, you can learn one thing retail within this span, right? And it's just like the classifieds, except it's digital. So OpenSea is just like eBay, but it's digital good. So your question's super awesome but it's a function of time. And I even think that aggregation will be long tail, which is beneficial. Sorry to go, to go super down the rabbit hole, but it's like a really good question I wanted to hit. I think another way to summarize this in a more simpler form is that if we look at human productivity as a linear line, so you have very unproductive people and very productive people, machines are coming in at the middle, trying to take over yeah. these jobs that, the, the middle layer we talk about. Because there's machines coming in to take over those middle layer, then we will start to define what the new middle layer would be, which is the integration between machines and human and human and machines. So we are segregating this, this line into more segments and you, you have different kinds of middle layers being formed. You have small little boutiques catering to very specific sub-segment of people. Like you said, it's, it's a feature. It's a feature to be able to just solve this very specific needs by this specific segment of, of people in this timeline. Oh, this like one of the things I love about the conversations with Lisa is she says in like ten words what I just spent like twenty minutes talking about. So it's <laughs> it's it's an art. Say so actually, let me just simplify it down. So no, but that also takes us to changing that window of machines coming for the middle and then haves and have nots. And like crypto has this promise of you know helping out on this long tail distribution, whether it's you know boutiques as features or whether it's working together with AI to augment instead of replace and expand markets. And like that takes us into like this idea of like obligation and what that means. So do you mind just rephrasing the question for everybody in case they've like lost track of it? Because we went through, you know, the splitting of the middle, but the idea of like token design and governance and like political instantiation and like obligation there. And it's like, it's such an important question. And it's it's kind of taboo right now. I think it's going to become more and more important in the future. But like, I just I really want to you mind just like rephrasing it for everybody in case anybody just joined. Yeah. So we talked about two things that was quite a big risk when we are talking about redesign, this crypto renaissance that we are talking about. The first one is the social fabric that we are very comfortable with. We have already discussed that. And the second thing is the whole point of decentralizing is also distributing power and responsibility and the consequence of all these different decisions that we make. How do we do with them? One way I like to look at things is that there are a lot of unknown unknowns. This is the very esoteric nature of this entire space. We don't know what's out there. And we don't have the observability, we don't have the telescope, we don't have the microscope to go and see what's going on. And when we're missing this information, we don't have enough knowledge to go and make the right decisions that will affect us in the long run. And maybe by that time, the consequences are not affecting people who make decisions, which is a big flaw in traditional finance, but it's the new people, the laggards who are in. How do we protect them? How do we make sure that this governance systems that we're going to be creating it's not just a replication of the flaws and the inefficiencies in traditional finance. How do we make it even better today in this future that we are building? I'm just going to say something for just a minute to give you a context for, I think, like the best way to answer that. There's a quick and easy answer, but I just want to take a step back since everybody's been patient anyway and just push my luck and see if I can just lay out this idea. So like the micro answer would be governance and token design and governance of tokens and blah, blah, blah. And that's like the right answer. 100 percent correct. But that's like not enough. It doesn't do it justice. I mean, your point of saying we're doing something new, it's unknown, it's unknowns. Like we have no idea of going to like, that's why history is like super helpful um, because it's that long tail unlock where maybe this actually has value where it doesn't if your professor just typing out words that nobody reads, but maybe we can actually like learn from it and see what happened last time and do some scenario or what's likely to happen or at least get a sense of what's the types of unintended consequences and what are like the places you can push to really exercise control and governance tokens it's going to be one of those. And so like, let me just take a minute and like set that stage. So let me just finish the historical story too. So like what happened after the Renaissance, you have this awesome unlock and then people are able to trade and you have emergence of, you know, middle class. And now we have this consolidation and we're saying, hey, the threat is to pull it apart. Well, it's adoption back on these tools again. And so that lasted for a while. And then the, the, as it went from medieval aggregation into decentralized disaggregation, disintermediation, reformation, Renaissance, then after a while it swings back with like the rise of the nation state, right? And 
and like the kind of like a nation state strikes back, right? And so the pendulum swings back and those entities start orchestrating hierarchy again and they're able to co-op the decentralized technologies. They, they essentially co-op the printing press and they co-op some of the ledgers and those become tools for aggregation. And then they, they layer on like new types of like power in terms of that aggregation. And like part of that is through identity. And so like, how do you think about like yourself and your relationship to others and the sociocultural fabric? And so a number of political theory, and this is like the rise of controlling language. And so like the nation state is us striking back and that's where we are today. And they co-opted this technology. And so like, you can ask, how does a nation state exercise power? Well, they they exercise power economically for sure politically, militarily for sure, and threat of military, like the political theorists will say like, hey, if you have to exercise military against your own people, you've kind of already lost the day. Like the really successful power structures that control communities don't even have to do that. They're able to, they're not only able to shape behavior with the threat of that against economic incentivization, they can actually shape the window through which you view your reality. And like, so before at the Renaissance, there was no nation. You never thought of yourself as a a French person or a German person. You were connected in this village to this family. And now I was connected much more decentralized all over the place in these international networks. And now I start to think of myself as like a member of a nation, right? And like this idea of nation was new. I never even thought, that never would have popped into my head, just like these economic tech wouldn't have popped into my head. And like me as like a Frenchman or a German or Brazilian, or like that's also a new concept too that never would have popped into my head. And that is my primary identity, fundamentally who I am. Oh, I'm an American before I'm anything else. Or Brazil, like, so the tool of power isn't just military, or economic, but the political tool of power is like shaping that window and how I see myself. And so the political theorists say like, essentially these nation states are like imagined communities, which sounds crazy, like great book on it, Benedict Anderson, it's literally called Imagined Communities. And he says, hey, the nation state is like an imagined community just by consensus. And the economics people like you, Lisa, you understand like, hey, economics is consensus of value. We get that consensus, turtles all the way down to consensus, the econ people understand that as it moves out into poli sci and obligation and opportunity, like we still have this consensus. And so like, if you believe that narrative around how this shook out last time with the rise of the nation state through imagined community and consensus, and even today, like nation state primacy is like imagined community and consensus. What's really interesting about crypto, and thanks for letting me do this circle all the way around, is crypto essentially does the same thing, right? It's this imagined community like of shared consensus where we basically like put the locus of our identity on it, right? And so like, it actually in that sense becomes a nation state or it becomes a state. So just like the medieval people couldn't have imagined what a state was and then all of a sudden a state was mentally, you know, identity projected and then it became real. TLDR, where we're creating these little micro economies. <laughs> no, because I have a lot of things to add. And so whoever is listening, the TLDR is that where we're creating these little micro economies, we're basically recreating how nation states work. The, the legal structure, the social contracts, the, the legal contracts in NFTs, we're talking about citizen rights, on-chain rights, reputation, on-chain reputation. These things, they can exist today. I love the fact that you talk about, you know, imagined communities. I think as an economist, the way you look at imagined communities is you look at this thing called the social utility function or social optimization function. As a society, what are we optimizing? We're optimizing one main thing, and it could be anything. You come into the system, it's so easy to go in and out of the system. I come into the system because I agree with your ideology, your philosophy, and I buy into the token because I want to be part of the governance to keep growing this. Because one of the biggest problems with the world today is that you're American, I'm Singaporean, because we are born in this country, or the country where we're born. It's a lottery. It's not fair. Someone who is born in Yemen, born in crisis period, it's not fair to him. He could be exactly like me, but just from a different country. That's not fair. Today, with technology, we can level up the playing field. We can start creating these social imagined communities, these social communities based on what kind of common ideologies. And you know where this gets really fun? You can have communism, you can have socialism, democracy, whatever political, social, government systems you want. Then you just allow the market to dictate how the communities grow. Then we can stop fighting about what social system works because the market will tell us if this social system fails because no one is there anymore, no one wants to govern, no one sees a future in that, then there's no point arguing. We know that this is a flawed system. It's the best experiment ever, I think. I just wanted to do a summary. It's 
it's education, off-chain integration, as well as governance. I think these are the three biggest key to unlocking how we're going to make this truly impactful. It's not just protesting on the streets or it's not just arguing with people on Twitter. It's not just being a keyboard warrior. These are tangible things that we can do right now to make a very, very big, significant difference in the future. And you're right. The society can only focus on one thing at a time. And I think this conversation that we're, we're talking about, it's more of what the society expects in the next 5, 10, 20 years. But it's okay, we can start doing it now because we plant the seed, we enjoy the tree in 20 years. And if anyone wants to figure out how you can really make a real impact, that's it. Education, off-chain integration, and governance. Well, thank you everyone. Anyone else has any questions? The current state of governance tokens seems to really favor early investors. Like if I'd really want to be a part of, say, you're in finances governance right now, I'd need to be a multimillionaire to really get in. And it seems almost obligatory to do that because if you don't, it's very hard to find meaningful initial investment. It's that promise of reward that brings people. D doesn't that kind of threaten the long tail and participation? I do have a big thing to say about that because this question comes up quite often in our Discord chat. And I've been thinking about it for, for a very long time because I think it's quite hard to avoid that. Because, you, I will, you're right. You need people with capital to come in first. It could be financial capital, social capital, whatever. And because they're the big risk takers, it is inevitable that they will get returns at the end because the risk of failing is also quite high. And we only see success, so we see that kind of huge returns. So this is something we can't change. But what can we change? If we look at this from a value standpoint, and I always go back to the old economist. So an economist, one of the father of economics, is David Ricardo. And so Ricardo mentioned that when we look at value creation, because in a community, we are all creating value. And what these capitalists do when they provide capital, they get economic rent, which is whatever you mentioned, the kind of very strong returns. And this is something you can't change. But what you can change is that whoever that's paying the economic rent, if they can create even more value, that will make sense. How does that mean? It means, let's say, let's not even go to yuan. Let's just talk about a POS system, no proof of stake. One of the big risks of proof of stake is that whoever comes in first, you just keep validating and then you get so much because you can put so much upfront that the probability of you being a validator increases significantly. So it's really unfair. And so you can collect economic rent like risk-free. At the same time, if we look at the macro system overall, why are people validating these transactions? Because you're creating protocols, you're running nodes, you're using DLT to validate whatever transactions that can be created. And the value over here has to be so much more than the economic rent extracted from this POS system. And if we can balance this out, this will make sense. This, this will be a very robust ecosystem. Josh, thank you for sharing. And thank you for everyone staying. I'll speak to all of you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for staying throughout this entire video. If you're interested to learn more and you want to join the community, do check out our Discord, check out our Academy, and you get to watch these videos for free as well without any ads. And also grab the book that I've talked about earlier on. The book summarizes a lot of what we're trying to build, what we're trying to design, and the different aspects that can be changed during the entire design process. We also just launched Econteric. Econteric is really economics plus esoteric because this space is so complicated and so difficult. What we want to do is to make it easier for anyone to come and learn and be part of this system. So in Econteric, we are breaking down the different analytics and different data to give you more insights, to understand the robustness from a very fundamental level of the health of this ecosystem. So check out econteric.com and I'll see you there. Bye. Great.